When two teenage girls went out for the night, their two friends who couldn't go had no idea that such a small choice would be the difference between life and death. For three months, the search ensued, but once they were discovered, the evidence that found the killer seemed a bit too good to be true. An entire family was arrested, all but one man, whom police believed to be the mastermind. He would never be seen again, and has become one of the most wanted men in the world. However, the theories of a police cover-up, a sadistic killing cult made up of those in power, and a young boy as a scapegoat had the media turning this case upside down and inside out. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and today's case is going to be about the twisted torture and murder of the Alcaster girls. Now, we are going to be discussing the very many theories that are involved in this case that happened 30 years ago, including where their alleged killer is hiding. If you don't know, it is my absolute passion to tell these stories, and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up, and leaving a nice comment down below. You can also follow my Instagram at Brooke McKenna underscore or my vlog channel, Brooke McKenna Vlogs. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1992 in Spain and three teenage girls had become best friends while growing up together in their very small village of Alcacer. Now, they were also all born of Valencia, which was not too far away. This was Antonia Gomez Rodriguez, who was 15 years old and went by Tony, as well as Maria Desiada Hernandez Fulch, who was 14 years old and went by Desiree, and so was Miriam Garcia Ibora who was their other best friend. So Tony, Desiree, and Miriam did everything together. Tony was known to be more of a very nervous, timid girl, but was incredibly compassionate. She had once found a stray kitten on the side of the road, and she took all of her extra time taking care of this cat. She was a very mature 15-year-old who could not wait to turn 16 because that is when she could get a job. She was not interested in school, but in making money to buy, especially clothes, but to just kind of have money of her own. Desiree was known as being completely headstrong, almost stubborn, and she was extremely competitive and athletic. Every sport she played, she would compete and she would be either first or second. There was nothing else other than first or second for Desiree, but she was also one of the more social of the girls. She could talk to pretty much anything. She would skate around town talking to anybody in her path. She was just one of those girls who had no problem mingling. Now, just like Tony, Desiree really didn't have any interest in her studies either. She liked sports. She liked to do things. She didn't like to just sit in a classroom. Miriam, however, was the girl who loved school. She thought that it was her top priority at this time, so she actually went to school in a neighboring town, which was the La Florida school or the La Florida Institute and she was thriving there. She was really good at her studies and that was really a big focus for her. She was quite shy though so even though she went to this school she didn't make many friends there that she could hang out with outside of school and since Tony and Desiree had been with her for so long, they lived so close, it was just easier that she kept hanging out with them. They were her best friends after all. When not hanging out with them though, Miriam loved to be on her own. She loved poetry and deep diving into her emotions as more of a sensitive girl. Overall, these girls complimented each other in the best of ways and they were always together, which most of the time meant that they were hanging out around town at one house or the other and then at night they would often go to different parties. Now, they were living their lives to the fullest, but unfortunately none of them knew that their lives would be ended too soon. On November 13th of 1992, which happened to also be Friday the 13th, Desiree, Tony, and Miriam all decided they were going to go out that night to a club that a lot of the teenagers went to. Desiree and Miriam actually did both go to school that day, but Tony skipped out and she was going to hang out with her other friend, who was Esther Martinez, at her home to just kind of pass the time. And around 2 p.m., Miriam would come home from school. She would kind of stop by her home where she asked her father, if he would be able to drive them to the nightclub that night. Now, unfortunately, her father, who was Fernando, he would be sick with the flu, and it was 
so bad that he was kind of bedridden. So, you know, her mother was like, no, he's too sick. He can't take you. You'll have to find another way if you miss the bus. This was a sickness that was actually going all around the village that was so small and so, you know, sociable with the different people because the friend that Tony had been hanging out with that day, Esther, had also fallen ill and so she was also bedridden and she could not go that night with these girls. She was one who would often go with them to socialize and this night, even though she wanted to go, her body just wasn't allowing her to. Though they had all planned to meet at Esther's that night, and so that plan stayed the same, and they all slowly made their way to Esther's home, even though she wasn't going to be able to go with them, and Esther had no idea that because of this flu, she would survive a horrible end. Tony, Desiree, and Miriam all headed out on their journey to the town of Picasent. Now, this was the neighboring town of Alcaster, which was about 30 minutes away from Esther's home, which was on the edge of Alcaster. So they didn't have too much of a walk, but it was going to take them some time to get there since they couldn't find a ride and they had missed the bus. They left Esther's home around 8 p.m. telling no one of their official plans and they would not come home that night or the next morning. Now, Tony especially was always home by around nine because that is when the family would eat dinner. So they knew it was strange that she wasn't home by nine. So even if she was planning on going with her friends to this club, she hadn't informed her family that she was going to be gone that night and that she wouldn't be home for dinner. Eventually, all of their families were going out on the town searching for them because they had started to call one another to say, are the girls at your home? No. Are the girls at your home? No. And they were realizing that these girls had never come home. Although when they went to search this town, they could not find them anywhere, nor did anyone know where they were. So Miriam's father, Fernando, who had been sick that night, he was even up and searching as well. And he went to the sergeant of the police and asked him to help in the search. But the police said, that she was probably just acting foolish as a teen and they needed to wait 24 hours to do anything. Instead of waiting for them to come home though, Fernando was out that night and the next day searching and they even got the media involved and Fernando was going to these different newspapers giving them photos of the girls as well as what they were believed to be wearing and where they were thought to have gone. It was also quite cold that night and so the parents were worried because these girls weren't wearing coats, they weren't wearing jackets, they were wearing typical, you know, either school or nightclub outfits. So they did not bring things to sustain themselves in a cold night. Desiree's mother went on the news saying that if this was a prank for her to please come home and Miriam's mother went on the news and she was in tears saying that this was just a complete nightmare. The parents then gathered together around 9.30 p.m. of November 14th, which was around 24 hours since they had had left Esther's home and vanished. They had all collectively decided that they were going to go to the civil guard post, which was Spain's basically nationwide police. And so they had gone to them and forcefully reported their daughters missing because nobody wanted to listen. And unfortunately, there still was no rush in searching for them and it would take days for anything to begin. Meanwhile, it's becoming more and more obvious to these parents that their daughters weren't coming home. And day by day, every single parent claimed that these girls would not have run away. They said that none of these girls had jobs. They didn't have any money. They didn't even ask for money for that night. So they would have had nothing on them. And it seemed odd that they would have left with nothing to their names. Desiree had also packed a bag for her skating trip the next morning and Miriam was found to have a money box in her room with the equivalent of $120 in it and she hadn't taken any of it. Tony also had plans to hang out with another friend the next day and had not canceled. But at the same time, the parents had no idea where to look for their daughters. They didn't know where their daughters went when they really hung out other than if they were at the other's home or they were out at the different clubs, but they could not say exactly where they were headed that night. Now, it was also found that a day prior to the disappearance on November 12th, Tony had called into the local radio station. She was asked by the host, you know, what are your plans for this weekend? And she said she didn't know, but she was definitely not staying home. She then dedicated a song to Miriam and Desiree, as well as other girls that she was friends with. When the search finally began for police three days later, Esther would tell them the plans for that night or the plans that she at least knew of that they were going to go and do when she was still going with them. And they were going to go to the neighboring town of Picasent and they were going to go to this specific nightclub which was called Cooler 
or discotheca. Now, they were going to go there because a friend of theirs from school was actually having a fundraising event for the end of the school year trip that they would go on that they needed to raise some money for. So everybody was buying tickets to this event to be able to get in. These girls had been invited and they were all discussing with Esther whether they should hitchhike or just walk. Now Esther was actually telling them to hitchhike because it was scarier just walking on their own. But her mother was saying hitchhiking was going to get them in trouble one day. But when asked whether her friends would run away, Esther said that they were all very happy at home and that they would have told her if they were actually leaving town. With this lead, they were able to investigate further by going to this club, figuring out who was there that night, but nobody appeared to remember them and said that they were not at this party at all. Now, the fundraising event was actually just pre-purchase tickets in order to get in. You couldn't buy a ticket at the door, you couldn't pay your way in, and none of these girls had bought a ticket prior. They also were not said to have any money on them to try to get in either. It was unknown what their plan was to get inside, if they had already had a disgust with somebody who was just going to let them in, or if they had entirely different plans that nobody knew about. The search for them consisted of 12 different vehicles who were driving all around the community handing out these missing persons posters, and the police were now really pushing the fact that these girls were not runaways in order for witnesses to hopefully come forward. Tony was said to be wearing a Mickey Mouse Disney watch, but that was really the only thing that stood out about what these girls were wearing that maybe somebody would have noticed if they would have seen it. Investigators did decide to walk the same exact route that these girls had walked in order to get to Esther's home that day and then possibly hitchhike or walk all the way to Picasent. Miriam lived the furthest away, so she would always, from her home, walk to Tony's house and together they would walk to Miriam's house and then they often would go from there to a little arcade that a lot of the teens went to, which was a little bit further and they did have to backtrack to go to Esther's, but they liked to do that sometimes. And so then they would backtrack a little bit and go all the way to Esther's home together. And finally, a witness did come forward and this was a boy named Francisco Soria who said he knew the girls from school. And he claimed that early in the evening, he had seen the girls in the middle of Alcacer, which didn't really make sense as in the evening, they should have already been to Esther's home. However, it was theorized that Francisco maybe saw them earlier that afternoon and just thought it was evening or called it evening and that this is when the girls were actually walking to Esther's home. His statement was not really helpful in the investigation until he told them that he had asked the girls if they were going to the party at the cooler and they had told him that they weren't. Then it was found that Tony had called another friend named Sarah around 5 p.m. that afternoon before the girls left for Esther's, asking if she could hang out that night, if she wanted to hang out with the girls and go to Cooler. And thankfully, her mom answered the phone and said she's napping. I'll give her the message when she wakes up. And so she didn't go. And she was yet another girl who could have been missing as well. But soon enough, another witness would speak to police. And this was Francisco Hervez. And that was the great thing about this being such a small village is that if somebody had seen the girls, they knew who they were. And so this man claimed that he was driving around and around 8.15 p.m. that night, he had seen the girls walking down the road and then sitting at a traffic light. This was a few blocks away from Esther's home and he knew of the girls, but he wasn't really friends with them. He had his girlfriend in the passenger seat, so he stopped and he offered them a ride and asked them where they were going. And when they said Picasent, he said, oh, that's perfect because I'm actually headed there to get my car fixed at the auto repair shop. And so I can drop you off once we get into town so you can be closer. And so they all agreed that this was a good idea and they got inside and allegedly took this ride to where he dropped them off at a gas station because it was basically the stop before he would kind of veer off from where the cooler would have been. So it would have been a longer trip if he would have just dropped them off at the auto repair shop. So he dropped them off at this gas station. He said he didn't know anything about what happened to them after that. But Francisco was adamant with police that they were not running away. They were only hitchhiking to Picasent and they were happy for the ride. Around this time, another witness said that he was a longtime friend of theirs named Jose 
Kenno, and he had seen them walking through Picasent around that same area of the gas station, and that they kind of stopped to speak to each other for a while and then walked on their separate ways. Then another witness, who was a woman who lived in that area, claimed that she had seen three girls walking down the street from her window on the main road of Picasent in the direction towards that nightclub. And they were waving down cars, appearing to try to get a ride. However, she said this was also at 8.15 p.m., which is where it kind of gets muddled because these girls were said to leave from 8 to 8.15 around Esther's home. Nobody really knew the exact time. And then they were seen by this driver around 8.15 and then they were seen walking in Picasson. So it was all around that same area, but no one knows exactly what time periods this all happened in. And she watched as a car ended up stopping and picking them up. Now this was a white four-door sedan and she said there were actually four boys inside. They opened up the back door for them and the three girls got inside and they drove away. She couldn't describe the car really more than that, even with pictures to try to help her. She said she really just didn't know, but she saw that they got in. The only strange thing about this was the fact that, okay, yes, they were hitchhiking, but Cooler was only a few minutes away from there. It would not have been a much longer walk, so it begs the question, why did they need a ride to this nightclub if it really was the girls going to Cooler? Did they not know where it was? And so they thought maybe it was a longer distance. Were they just tired? Were they hitchhiking to another place? There were many questions at this point, even with this sighting. The media started off as a huge asset in this case, making the public aware and interested in Miriam's father, Fernando, who is a man we will be talking a lot about in this case. He was not letting the spotlight off of his daughter. He went on every interview, every just TV show spot that he could get every time he could get in front of the cameras or get his quote put in a newspaper or anything he was doing it and he was also pushing the other families to do so as well. Now one journalist had actually heard about these girls in Alcacer disappearing and she lived in another place but she had daughters of her own and so she came because she wanted to help with the media side of this case. She was actually the one to decide that they should turn the missing person posters into color because she believed that if the people of the town believed that these girls were beautiful that they would be more likely to want to help find them which is heartbreaking but unfortunately true. And so these missing person posters were turned into color and plastered everywhere. It was also said that there were two different news stations that were for this area and they had two different hosts, a man and a woman, who were basically fighting over who was giving the better coverage of this missing persons case. Now the police would then widen their search nationwide and they were searching every possible area, body of water, home, anything that these girls could have been hiding in or could have been dumped in. They told the families that they would not stop searching until they found these girls and then they allegedly went to the families and were saying we have this home where we believe that the girls are being held. A judge owns this home but we cannot get in because there's no proof and a tip has not been sent in saying that he's involved. And so suddenly a tip came in saying that this man was involved and the home was raided and nothing was found. Fernando Garcia, Miriam's father, wrote this tip because he was not letting anything go past the police when it could lead to his daughter. Police were also turning to inmates who had just been released or who were still in prison to see if they had heard anything about these girls, you know, anyone bragging about the murder or kidnapping them or anything involved, but they weren't really hearing anything. And tips were coming in from everywhere, really, saying that they had seen these girls after they had vanished, which was great. They were really hoping that somehow these girls had just run away or they had gotten away from their captors and that somebody had seen them and they were still alive. One tip was saying that Miriam was actually asking for $20 in Badajo, which was not too far away from where they disappeared. However, these tips were not coherent in most cases and nothing was leading to the girls because they were in so many different places that nobody could search them all. Some of the public actually sent in letters to 
this investigation with money inside to help pay. And there was a bank account set up for this investigation that was placed in a newspaper so that people could donate there as well. Because they had already allegedly spent five million on posters and cards. This investigation was so big, it even caught the attention of the president of the Spanish government, Felipe Gonzalez. As the search expanded, they believed that possibly the girls had been taken to England and that is why nobody could find them in that area. So they began working with the Scotland Yard in order to search for these girls and Fernando actually quit his job and flew to England to help spread this story. He tried to go on TV interviews there as well. They weren't really as receptive, but he did try to do anything to tell people in England about his daughter and her friends. But the journalist who had come to Alcacer and who was the first to say, maybe we should put their missing persons posters in color, she would be the first one informed. She got a call and on the other side of the line, she heard they found an arm sticking out of the ground wearing a Disney watch. She instantly knew that this was Tony and that the girls had been found. But before the families could even be told, the news were calling them and asking them questions, wanting their reactions. And that is the beginning of the media attention really becoming something horrific. Three months after they vanished, 75 days of searching on January 27th of 1993, two beekeepers were searching the land, doing their own jobs when they came across part of an arm with a Disney watch. And this was in a pit, which was basically in a wasteland in La Romana. And it was 30 minutes away from Picasent. They decided when they saw the arm to call the police, but the local magistrate or the civil officer who was Judge Bort took quite a long time to get there. In fact, it was hours because he was actually excavating another body in the town over and was busy at that time. And exactly that same day, a whole entire team was put on this case and the others were fired. However, they were not able to come quickly either because they were searching an entirely different area. You see, the original team was said not to be doing a good enough job and so every single person was dismissed and were replaced by a task force called UCO or Unit of Central Operations and they were put into charge even though they had not been there since the beginning. They were starting fresh. The UCO as well as Judge Bort would show up way later in the day and the bodies were being excavated but they were found to be stacked on top of one another in this pit that appeared to have been dug months prior. Judge Bort arrived and immediately demanded that the beekeepers who had found the girls leave the scene and not tell anybody what they heard or what they saw and to just leave. He finally did you know, lock down the whole scene and begin the investigation when he could. But like I said, it was very late. Many hours had gone by. Many people had trampled through the crime scene and the excavation had already begun. Three girls were pulled out of this pit wrapped in what appeared to be a rug. And this was more like a greenish blue carpet that was covered in mud and turned brown due to that. And two of the bodies were found to have been decapitated and everyone had their hands tied behind their back. There were also items found around or inside allegedly of this pit, which was a glove, binoculars, three belts, like actual belts to hold up your pants, two other pieces of clothing, including a torn corduroy jacket and a large t-shirt with a white t-shirt inside that had a red logo on the front. There was also a note with illegible writing as well as a piece of sailing rope, a video game cartridge, and two synthetic black fibers. Police did claim that they also found a shell casing underneath the girls' bodies in the bottom of the pit that was a nine millimeter. There were also pieces of paper that were torn that were just kind of thrown about and there was also other pieces of trash and it really did appear that most of this was simply garbage. However, they did not know yet that this trash would mean everything in this investigation. Now, most of the family members of these girls cannot remember this time. Their memories were lost to the trauma that was too hard for their brains to handle and reporters would capitalize on that and they would begin recording very intimate moments where these family members were being informed that their daughters, their loved ones, had been murdered and they had been found. They were following them around with cameras, 
showing them at their most vulnerable state of grief and then showing it to the public. You can watch them scream out in pain and fear and anger. And this was a real invasion of privacy, but they didn't have the strength to tell them no. They didn't even know that that was an option. All they were focused on was what they had just found out. Next, the media would do a live show with the family members on stage, cameras on them, a full audience in this room. And this was not because the families wanted to do it, but because the media did. The host would ask a medical examiner in front of the family members if these girls had been abused. When this had not been discussed yet, nothing was known about any of this, and the family members were baffled. Fernando became the front runner in this case because he was the one on camera the most. Everybody in the public knew him, so everyone kind of turned to him as their guiding light, and he was asked to speak, and he said that basically he just wanted justice to work. Many in the audience started screaming for the death penalty and nobody on stage really said anything about that or discussed any of that. But Miriam's siblings were forced, kids were forced to read their sister who had just been murdered to read her poems that she had written. They were sobbing, they didn't want to do it, but the host just kept forcing the paper in their hand. Then suddenly in front of everyone, these families were being told by a woman that two men had been arrested and were being interrogated for these murders. Next, the funerals came and even those were being broadcast. But it would be found later on that due to the task force not being available, nor was Judge Bort, at the beginning of finding these bodies, it was an absolute mess when they were excavated and everything before that. The excavation was said to begin very quickly because everybody was tired and wanted to go home. And so the photographer was actually helping with the excavation instead of taking photos. And no photos were really taken besides one measly photo of dirt before they excavated that you can't even really tell what it is. Even back then, police protocol was to document and photograph every step of the way for the investigation, but this was not done. No one thought it was necessary as they pulled these girls out and the same thing occurred. There were no photos of the evidence that was collected and put into bags that was allegedly scattered around and inside of the pit. Photos were taken after they were moved, but there is no account of where exactly they sat that could have made a huge difference in the investigation. All of this was found to be something done usually in, in investigations in Spain in this time, but for some reason it just didn't happen here. The scene was finally cordoned off that night when the police captain was finally brought to the scene and they began doing the investigation partially in the dark. And then once it got too dark, they had to wait till the next morning. When this loose evidence that had been put into these bags were taken to the police station, they were gone through and it was found that a few pieces of this trash went together like a puzzle. And once back together, it showed a pamphlet for the University Hospital of La Fay. Now, it was from the year prior in 1992 when the girls were murdered and it was possible that this had something to do with the murders, so they began to look into it. Because this hospital was only about two hours from the dumping ground and 19 minutes from Picasent. Now this pamphlet was for outpatient care for a venereal disease of a man named Enrique Inglés. Now, his birth date was said to be 7-25 in 1996, which would mean that he was around 27 years old. When police tracked him down, they found that Enrique lived in Cataroa, about 14 minutes away from Picasent, and he also had a criminal record. Now, Enrique actually refused to open his door and barricaded himself inside when the police finally arrived at his home. Then they had to go and receive a search warrant to get inside, but when they finally got inside, they found that it was a room of people. This home was full of people. And the police did do a search of the home at this point, but they really didn't even know what they were looking for other than direct evidence to the murder. However, while there, the phone did ring and the answering machine picked up and they could all hear it in the home. There was a man on the other line who asked the blonde to find where the motorcycle lever and discs are and to bring two sleeping bags. No one in the home claimed to know who this man was that was speaking or what he meant. Another man then walked into the home 
freely like he lived there and the police asked him, who are you? And he claimed that he was the blonde. He then was identified as Miguel Ricard. Now at that moment, a guard walked into the home as well, their apartment complex, and was asking Miguel why he parked his car that way. And the car in question was a small white sedan. At this point, everyone in that home was brought in for questioning, but no fingerprints or blood were found inside the car that allegedly belonged to Miguel. Now, it did not take long for Enrique, the first man that they had been brought to, to confess to the killings. He said he was at the nightclub with them and they did not want to dance with him, so he killed them. However, after listening to him confess for a while, investigators believed that he had a very low IQ, possibly some mental illness, and would not be capable of this. And diving deeper into Enrique's history, it was found that he was actually suffering from schizophrenia, which does not make a killer, nor does it make it so they can't be a killer, but investigators' guts were telling them that this was not the guy. Two days later, he was actually released and he told the media that he was innocent. Now, investigators were really focusing on Miguel Rickhart at this time and he claimed he knew nothing and at that point of the disappearance, he was having dinner with his girlfriend. Now, when his girlfriend denied this, he said, actually, I was in prison during this time. So investigators went to this prison and he had been incarcerated around this period. However, during the time of the kidnapping, he was on leave from prison. In the interrogation room, he could not stop staring at the missing persons posters of these girls that was on the wall. And he told police that Enrique could not hurt a fly, that they were right, he was not a killer. But a little while later, he was actually admitting to being at the dumping grounds but claimed that he wasn't the killer. He said that they picked up the girls before they had gotten to the nightclub and then a man named Antonio had stopped at a factory and gotten out and took the girls one by one and Miguel could hear them screaming and he believed that Antonio had sexually assaulted them and then three shots rang out. Then he fully named this Antonio man as the killer of Tony Desiree and Miriam. However, when he was asked how quickly the shots rang out, he then made his gun into a hand, pointed it at the ground and said, boom, boom, boom. Like it happened one after the other, but he was acting out exactly what happened as though he had done it or he had seen it being done, which his statement did not say. He was then arrested for the murders as well. Now, one of the people also brought in from that home and interrogated was Enrique's sister. So also in English. And she was named Kelly. And she began to talk about how her older brother was actually a very bad person. You see, she and Enrique had about seven siblings and then the two of them. So there was nine all together. And this whole family was actually known to the police because of their brother, Antonio. Now, he was allegedly a frequent drug supplier and he was often in jail. And at the point of when, you know, everyone was brought in, he was on leave from prison, but he was supposed to have gone back about six months prior. Kelly claimed that Antonio would often use Enrique's social security documents due to this to avoid capture because Enrique didn't often leave the house. She now named Antonio as Antonio Inglés, her brother. But Enrique also had a lot to say about his brother Antonio, and he said that Antonio once put a gun to his head and told him that if he was a nuisance, that Antonio would shoot him and kill him. That he was a very violent man, and that everyone just agreed with what he said to make it so that they were safe. That the whole family was afraid of him, including their mother. Their father had passed away, but including their mother. They said one day he would be fine and the next day he would be evil and not care about the repercussions and that he would throw knives if people wouldn't do what he wanted them to do. And he would also beat his own mother. This all started at a very young age and never really ended. Yet when the police came to arrest everybody, they didn't believe that he was ever there. But then Kelly began to say he was. He just escaped through the window and ran away. However, police didn't even believe this was possible because the family was 20 floors up and there was no 
stairs down from the window. There was literally just building that he would have had to have fallen down to get away. So they did not believe this statement. But when his mother was actually interviewed by the media, she didn't even want to talk about him because she said if he saw her talking about him, he would come back and he would kill her. You could see the fear in her son's eyes, who was Antonio's little brother, as she began to talk about it and he kept telling her to be quiet. Miguel Rickhart had also officially named Antonio Inglés as the killer. So police believed that he was the man who was also on that answering machine that nobody really wanted to talk about. But the search for him began and soon enough they realized that this was not going to be an easy catch. Meanwhile, they began learning more about Miguel Ricard because they had no one corroborating his story. He was 24 years old at this time and he had grown up with an abusive alcoholic father. And after his mother died when he was three, he kind of grew up just with his father. So at 16, he dropped out of school, started experimenting with drugs, and he got his girlfriend pregnant, then enlisted in the Spanish army. And once he came back, his girlfriend didn't want anything to do with them. And so he would split his time between living with her and living with Antonio. The two of them combined really created a criminal lifestyle and Miguel's personality was said to be more weak and timid and easy to manipulate. He was a very nervous boy who could suddenly become aggressive and Antonio knew this and used this. Miguel would begin going to jail when he moved in with Antonio for things like illegal use of motor vehicles, which is why he was in prison and on leave when these girls were kidnapped. But it was a large jump from stealing cars to triple homicide. And this was believed to be due to Antonio's influence. You see, a little bit about Antonio is that he was born in Brazil and the family moved to Spain when he was about one or two. And his father was also an abusive alcoholic and his mother was not exempt from the abuse. But when her husband died, their father, Antonio was said to almost take the place of his father. But he then became even worse. At one point it was so bad, his mother tried to file a restraining order against him. He was going to prison many times throughout his life for stolen property, drug trafficking, robbery with intimidation, resisting arrest. However, the worst would come about a year prior to the Alcaster girls' murders. You see, a woman named Nuria Pura stole a bag of heroin from Antonio that he was planning to sell and she used it all. He ended up kidnapping this woman, bringing her to the family home, chaining her to a pillar and beating her for days. The only reason she was believed to survive was because the family all lived there, heard all this happening, and one of his other brothers went to the police and told on him. He was sent to prison for six years. None of the other family members got any sentencing for their part in this or witnessing this. And even though he got six years, he would be out of prison in one, but not necessarily because he was released. He was released, but not in that way. You see, the prison officials believed that he was a good guy and that it was okay for him to have a six-day leave. But then he never returned back. An arrest warrant to find him, to bring him back, was not issued until six months later in September 2nd, two months before the murders. They weren't even looking for him for six months. Now, the autopsies of these girls were performed by Dr. Fernando Verda and Francisco Ross, and they found that Tony, Desiree, and Miriam had all suffered severe head injuries, and at least two were shot in the back of the neck. Of course, two no longer had their heads. Tony had been decapitated. She had showed signs of sexual assault, and her cause of death was believed to be a gunshot to her skull. Desiree had been found to have been picked on by an animal after death and had also been decapitated. Her nipples had also been removed with what they believed to be pliers. And she was found wearing socks and also had signs of sexual assault. It appeared as though she had been actually stabbed in the torso as well as shot in the back of the neck. Miriam also showed signs of sexual assault. She had multiple teeth missing and her right hand was also missing. These girls had been tortured. However, at this time, the medical examiners refused to tell the public, nor the families, exactly what they found. And a civil guard, you know, one of the police officers, ended up going to Fernando, Miriam's father, and telling him that he needed to request a second autopsy because something was fishy here. Many suspicions around this time arose about a very specific man who was Lieutenant 
Colonel Pedro Miranda, who was in charge of this investigation at this time. So that is exactly what Fernando did. He hired a different medical examiner, and so forensic scientist Dr. Frontella was brought in to proceed with the second autopsy. However, he was met with a lot of backlash from the original medical examiners, and he wasn't even let in the building for a while. And then when he finally got to the bodies, he allegedly found that they were completely washed off of all evidence, and that a lot of body parts were actually missing, and like injuries were removed. With what he had to go on, Dr. Frontella did find the same cause of death to have been the gunshot wounds to the back of the heads. However, he also found 15 hairs that were allegedly not matching Miguel. When Miguel knew that he was going to jail, he asked whether it would be just the regular 30 years that most people got in Spain during that time or whether it would be more. And he was told that it would be much, much more. And so he said, well, then I might as well tell the truth. So on March 2nd, two months after the arrest, Miguel went in to a judge and told him a statement. He said that they picked up the girls and they kept on driving and that the girls started to notice that they weren't being dropped off at the nightclub, that they were driving a long way. And one of the girls actually smacked Antonio in the back of the head because he wasn't listening when they were saying to turn around, to go back. They didn't want to keep driving anymore. And Antonio got really upset, said he was in charge, and started punching them. He then said for the first time that they had gone to a secluded hut that was less than a mile from this pit and forced the girls inside. He said that two of the girls were tied to poles while one was being sexually assaulted on a dirty mattress that was found there. And then Antonio untied the next girl and told Miguel it was his turn. But he said that he was not in the mood and Antonio got upset saying that if he wasn't with him, he would send him to hell. He then began hitting him in the back with his stick, so Miguel did what he was told. The girls were then left in the cold, dark night as Miguel and Antonio went to a bar nearby to get food. They then brought it back to the hut, but only offered the girls water. Antonio was the only one to take any water. Now, the girl, the third one, who hadn't yet been sexually assaulted, was then taken from the pole and sexually assaulted, and Antonio and Miguel were the ones who actually slept on the mattress as the girls just stood there or sat there. The next morning, Miguel said Antonio left for hours and came back and then told him that they had to kill and bury the girls. Miguel said he tried to talk him out of it and that they could set them free, but Antonio said he was an idiot. That day, Antonio told the girls that they were leaving, walked them out of the car, then asked Miguel to go get the carpet from the hut. And Miguel admitted that while he was doing so, Antonio must have tied the girls' hands behind their back because that's how he found them kneeling when he came back. And that is when Antonio shot every single one of them. And then they took this carpet, this rug, and buried them. Miguel said that what he remembered the most was the amount of blood that came from the bodies. And he also said that same gun that Antonio used, Miguel and Antonio's brother were going to use to rob a bank the next day. Now this hut was found and it was searched and one of Miriam's earrings were allegedly found on the floor inside, but no other evidence. There was not even a small amount of blood or blood spatter and neither was the area where, you know, a car would have parked where the murders allegedly occurred. There was no blood anywhere. And it's a bit harder to clean blood off nature than it is in a room. And this hut had pretty much become one with nature because it was so run down. Now with this confession, they knew that they had Miguel, but oddly enough, before the trial, Miguel began asking his lawyer for thousands of dollars saying that it was urgent. He started threatening him that if he didn't get the money, he knew how he would end up. He then claimed that Mauricio, Antonio's younger brother, one of them, was threatening him for money. But Mauricio was asked and he claimed that this never happened. But even though they had Miguel in custody and they were still searching adamantly for Antonio, but Miguel was going to trial, the problem was most offenders, even sex offenders, didn't serve their full sentences in Spain at this time. And Miriam's father, Fernando, decided that he was going to change this. And he was told he needed 2 million signatures to do so. 
the Alcaster Town Hall was actually set up to be the headquarters for this campaign and he traveled across Spain asking as many people as possible if they would sign. He stood for 20 hours a day at tables from morning to night talking to everybody explaining why they should sign it and he got so many signatures. It ended up being three million. But nobody knew the truth about what really happened. Miguel had told many different versions of this story and they still could not find Antonio. And Miguel then began saying that Mauricio, the man who was threatening him for money, was also a part of these murders. That he sexually assaulted one of the girls and killed her on his own. That the gun itself was from Mauricio. That he had found it or bought it and gave it to Miguel and Antonio. So at 16 years old, Mauricio was arrested as well. And he was said to act very mature for his age, which was quite strange. You know, he said that he wanted nothing to do with his brother Antonio or Miguel and that he was not involved in any of this. Now at this point, Miguel's lawyer resigned, wanting nothing to do with him anymore. But it turned out that Miguel was happy with this because this new lawyer, he ended up telling that he was told he could either confess and get a few years in prison, then get out and live like a king, or he would go to prison and he would die there. And that's why he confessed. And then suddenly the lawyer that Miguel was said to like was fired because he had wanted Miguel to take a polygraph test. And another lawyer had also gone to Miguel and said, look, this lawyer you like, he's actually against you. You need to fire him. I'll be your lawyer. So Miguel fired him and this new guy was his lawyer. Then when he had this new lawyer, he quit after 15 days, leaving Miguel with no one. But where was the other accused? Antonio Inglés was still missing, but tips had come in of sightings of him, possible sightings. And within the month of the arrest, it was said that he had been seen by a taxi driver who told him that he was going to Madrid and a hairstylist said that she had changed his hair. He was then turned away by a hostel who knew who he was and that he was a wanted man and they called the police but he was gone by the time they got there. He was then believed to go to a shed. His family would call this place the Gypsy because this was kind of the family hideout that they could go and be secure but the owner ended up calling the police on Antonio but Antonio escaped again. The same thing happened in another hostel. However, when police arrived, they found that he kind of staged his room and there were sexually explicit magazines displayed all over his bed. He was believed to then escape Valencia with an entirely new look and threatened a truck driver with an ax, which is how he began to be taken from one place to the other, which was inside containers and semi-trucks. He then threatened an elderly man to drive him to Quinza and two days after dropping him off, this man called the police and he said that Antonio told him that he was an innocent man being accused of three murders and needed to leave Spain. Then police believed that they had found a hiding spot for Antonio because they had found these fake IDs with his picture with him with bleached hair, which they had never seen before. So they started to show this to the public saying, this is what Antonio could look like today. They also there found a bloody tissue that they kept for DNA comparison later on. There were rumors of Antonio in Portugal, but nothing was confirmed and his fingerprints had been sent to Interpol to catch him anywhere in the world, but they were still having little luck. But this is when Fernando began to believe that neither Miguel nor Antonio killed his daughter and her friends. He believed that Antonio may have witnessed something he wasn't supposed to, and that is why he was framed. Now, he also said that Miguel's statements were simply written by investigators who knew about this case and he was forced to sign them. Fernando also said he had a lawyer, but his lawyer refused to let him look into this case, into the case file, and so he wanted to open a parallel investigation. And that's exactly what he did in 1996 after firing his lawyer and starting a whole team of his own. He got in contact with a criminologist named Juan Inglesio Blanco and they found that beekeepers, the ones who found the bodies were never actually questioned. They had been pushed off the scene, but nobody cared to know why they were there in this remote area and if they knew anything more. So they found out that these two were still alive, one being Gabriel and Cuico Gonzalez, who they found and were probably told that he was not going to talk about it. So then they tried the other one, who is Jose Sala, 
and his family would actually speak for him, saying that he was not going to say a single thing, he couldn't talk about it, they needed to leave. Now, if you remember, the investigators, especially Judge Bort, had told these beekeepers to keep their mouths shut, to not tell anybody about what they had seen or heard. So was this the reason why? they weren't speaking, or was it more? Fernando and his team believed that they arrested Miguel and believed that they were the killers because there was a piece of paper at the crime scene with a perfect amount of information, and it just seemed truly like a setup. They had asked for this case file or pieces of the case file and were denied every single time, so instead they ended up stealing it. You see, they could look at it, but they could not keep it. They could not take anything home to really dive into it, and so they decided to ask somebody in charge if they could come over and just let them look at it for a little bit. And while doing so, they actually went and copied it and then gave it back without this person knowing. They were giving it to the media after this to get the truth out there is what they said they were doing. And this is when this team was being threatened themselves. They were almost run off the road one night by a few cars whose plates were no longer registered. And a man even came to a table where Fernando was, you know, getting signatures and said, I was hired to kill you, but I decided against it. This did not stop them from talking though. And they actually said that the civil guard or the police department had fabricated evidence. That Miriam's earrings that were allegedly found inside this hut was planted. They would also go on many, many, many talk shows. They then also began to speak of the 11 unsolved murders that were around this time, around this area, of all young people who were sexually assaulted and brutally murdered. Now, their team believed that this was a network of cult-like individuals in power who were possible cannibals who would pay for the opportunity to be able to attack and murder and have trophies of human beings. And they also said that many friends and family of Antonio's actually said that yes, he was a horrible person, but he was also gay. And so they had a hard time believing that he would have done this, especially as motive to sexually assault them. This team said that once investigators heard that he might have been gay, they began saying that it was just because he hated women that he did this, not to sexually assault them. This is when the team kind of went haywire and especially Juan Blanco began to name suspects that they had that had no official evidence against them that they said were being investigated, such as Alfonso Calve, who was a former civil governor, film producer Bermudez de Castro, and Francisco Elena, who was the secretary for state of security. They were all basically people in power, some even politically, but Juan claimed that they were all being investigated. And this caused so much backlash that they had to come back the next night and apologize and say, look, we basically think that they're being looked into, but we don't believe that they're the actual killers. They also told every single detail about the autopsies to the public, even though this was still an ongoing investigation and investigators had decided not to tell because it could be the difference between knowing a killer and just having someone come and repeat what they had already heard. That is when the newspaper Levante would publish an article about Fernando using his daughter's murder for profit and attention. But he said that he used the media only when he needed his voice to be heard because no one else was listening. Now Desiree's mother at first sided with Fernando and believed that possibly this was a cover up that Miguel and Antonio had nothing to do with it. But she had since changed her mind after seeing what they had done on air, what this team had started to do and kind of like accuse other people and it was just getting out of hand. So at this point, Desiree's mother believed that what the police had done was correct, that Miguel was in custody, Miguel and Antonio were responsible and she just wanted justice. But it was now 1997 and Miguel had still not been to trial and it was actually illegal to keep them in jail past four years if they hadn't gone to trial. So they immediately started pushing for this to occur or he would be released. The investigation was then closed because that is the final step to go into trial and many of the public were outraged saying that the investigation should not have been over. They even protested outside with Fernando and his team. Fernando almost became a celebrity at this point. Everybody wanted to shake his hand, to speak to him, to tell him that they believed in him and that they supported him. 
but on May 12, 1997, five years since the murders, Miguel was taken to trial. Strangely enough, it was not broadcasted. However, it was recorded and was later shown to the public, and Miguel pled not guilty. Now, something different that I found about this trial, and I don't know if this occurs in all of Spain or if it still does, but Miguel was pretty much on the stand 24-7. He didn't have to say, I agree to testify. He didn't have to have his own time. Most of the time, they just sit there with a lawyer and be quiet, you know, while the lawyer does their thing. But Miguel sat there in front of a microphone and the judge would ask him questions. Everybody in the courtroom was just asking him questions and he could just answer right off the bat only if he wanted to. He didn't have to. He began to say that the civil guard tortured him, told him what to say, and basically were going to make his life horrible if he didn't confess, which is why he did. He would then start arguing with the judge, obviously upset every time the judge would basically ask him statements to try to catch him in a lie, to try to trick him into confessing. He then refused to answer the prosecution's questions, but they asked him anyway and just waited for his response that never came. And they were doing so hoping to prove that in his statements, he had already said evidence before the autopsies were even revealed. And so he would have been the only one, even if a civil guard officer would have written it out, they wouldn't have known those specific things yet if they had written it instead of someone who had been there. He was getting very, very angry at this. And it was said that most people after being in that courtroom and seeing how Miguel acted, believed that he was one of the killers. Now the bar owner where Miguel and Antonio had allegedly gone to get food the night that they had kidnapped the girls, he had testified and he said that he did see these two men coming into his bar and ordering, but they ordered three sandwiches for the two of them. He had said that he had seen another man waiting outside and he thought, oh, maybe that's who they're with. They didn't want to come inside. It was believed that this could have been Mauricio. So then Mauricio Inglés was brought in to testify and he denied going to the hut or being involved in the deaths, but he did admit that his brother, Antonio, had often talked about wanting to kidnap girls, but he thought it was disgusting. The entire Inglés family continued to deny that Antonio was the man on the answering machine when the police were there searching the home. And it's still unknown who this man speaking was and what he was talking about, why he needed sleeping bags and all of that. And Enrique Iglesias, the first suspect in this murder, who was almost immediately cleared, he took the stand and he claimed that Antonio was never violent at all. This was after he had been seen talking to police about it, that he was a horribly abusive man, and telling the media that he was. Then Enrique made a bizarre statement saying that he thought, thought that maybe he was the one that made that call because he was pretending to be Antonio to scare the family, alleging to the fact that Antonio was a scary man. But just like the police, most people did not take his statements as truth because he was more of the lower IQ and was often kind of making up stories and going on these tangents. Now the first medical examiners were brought to the trial and they claimed that they did not wash the full bodies. It wasn't like they were cleansing it of evidence. They were just washing the parts that they needed to see that were covered in mud. And they only said that they washed the clothes for the families to be able to identify that these were their children. But the second medical examiner, Dr. Frontella, was brought in and he suddenly made a claim that he had never made before. He said that the rug found with the girls had blood and semen on it. But the first medical examiners nor anybody else had ever found anything. He also said that there were seven different DNA profiles found on the girls. He then also randomly said that due to the larva found on the bodies that they could have been killed a month prior to anyone finding them which was strange because in all of Miguel's statements, they had been killed that night, which would have been three months before they were found. But he also believed that they were buried elsewhere and then brought to the pit. But the director of the Forensic Medicine Institute was brought in to clear everything up. And they claimed that there were at least five different DNA profiles that they were certain of 
and none of those belonged to Miguel. At this time, they couldn't just put this against the criminal justice system or, you know, swab a whole bunch of people. That was not something that was done. They just had to compare it to the perpetrator and they found it didn't match Miguel, so they moved on. On July 30th of 1997, Miguel told the court that the media had a big expectation about the sentencing, but that he is innocent and has a clear conscience. He told the media that they could now come and visit him in prison because he had not allowed them to before. But on September 4th, he was officially sentenced to 170 years. Many people were excited about this sentencing. Fernando and his team, however, were not. They believed an innocent man was going to prison. Six years later, in 2004, gender-based violence was finally acknowledged in Spain by the law. The Spanish Congress unanimously passed the Measures of Integral Protection Against Gender-Based Violence Act. Now, the Alcacer Foundation was then created by Fernando's team to help to work on finding the real killers, basically. A bank account was open for it once again for donations, but this foundation was believed to be a money grab. And Juan was caught saying that Fernando was raking in the money, he hadn't seen any of it, and that this money wasn't actually put into the foundation. In fact, the foundation wasn't actually set up because one of the other girl's parents were like, no, you're not gonna use our girls to make money and have their names out there for your foundation. We just want nothing to do with it. When Fernando was secretly recorded while being asked about the money, he said that money was all his. It didn't matter what he did with it. Fernando and Juan were then in court because a lawsuit was filed against them for fraud and slander. In 2009, Juan went to jail for two years because of this and he had a fine, but Fernando did not go to jail. He only had a fine of 285,000 euros. After Miguel was in prison for 21 years in 2013, he was a free man. He was said to be the most hated man in Spain. Nobody anywhere wanted him to stay with them or to host him. And reporters cornered him everywhere he went. His family disowned him. His ex-girlfriend and his daughter wanted nothing to do with him. And he actually had to grab a stick to keep the reporters away from him. And the police had to get involved to help him get on a train where the reporters still followed him. He was then put in a four-star hotel in Madrid for an interview that was supposed to happen. But this interview was canceled because the public did not want to see it and demanded it not air. He was said to take trains most days and nights and would talk to other people about the fact that he was a scapegoat. And then eventually there just was no trace of him anymore. And we don't know where he is today. In 2017, Congress passed state covenant against gender-based violence in order to include all forms of violence against women as official data, which was such a huge step in Spain after all of their protesting and Tony Merriam and Desiree's case was added to this. Now, in 2019, a documentary on Netflix was aired that renewed interest in this case for many. And it's also Netflix's first original documentary in Spanish. It does have subtitles if you do not speak Spanish like me, and it was so easy to follow along. But because of the renewed interest, Antonio Inglés was then added to Europol's most wanted list with an age progress photo of the man who he would be today at 55 years old. He is wanted for kidnapping, illegal restraint, hostage taking, murder, grievous bodily injury, and rape. But the main theory surrounding his whereabouts is that he either made it back to Brazil because he did have the dual citizenship or that he boarded a ferry, went overboard, and either escaped or drowned right there in the water. And this theory came about because the same year that the search for Antonio was reinstated, there was also a worker and a captain of a Lisbon transport that were being questioned once again. They had been questioned many years prior because it was found that Antonio had allegedly called this worker and had a phone conversation prior to his disappearance. And they believed that this meant that Antonio was a stowaway on this ship and only jumped overboard to avoid capture once the crew found him and turned him in. And so once they docked, the police were gonna be there. So he jumped overboard and there he either escaped completely to a place unknown or he drowned. Now Interpol allegedly did match a partial palm print on that ship to Antonio. 
There is one other theory that he was later spotted in Uruguay. However, most people do believe that whatever happened to him happened on this ship. However, there is a whole nother theory that Antonio was never at that home, like his family said, where he escaped through the window, that he was not even in the area when his family was arrested, that he had fled long before or was killed long before the girl's murders, that he had gotten out of prison and that he immediately fled the area and did not want to go back, or that he had witnessed something or gotten into some horrible trouble and was killed. And that is why he still can't be found today. It seems more likely that he would already have been deceased than that he could escape authorities searching for him in such a massive way and be on the most wanted list and have nobody know that it's him? Or does he have an entirely new family now who, who refuses to turn him in and who maybe knows his past or maybe doesn't even know who he is at all? Who knows? You could be sitting next to him right now and have no idea. After 30 years, this case is not as talked about. And the problem is, if he is not found by 2029, the statute of limitations will run out and he will no longer be able to be charged in these murders. We only have seven more years to find him. Now, one of the last things that this documentary talks about is the fact that Juan Blanco, the criminologist who worked with Fernando, claims that he has evidence that Miguel and Antonio were not involved, that it was one of these higher power cult-like network systems that like to take young people and do horrific things with them. That is because Juan Blanco insists that while he was staying with Fernando during all of this occurring, a priest had called him one night and asked him to come to a church. This priest had allegedly been given a tape by someone who was passing away and wanted somebody to know that this was the truth. So he allegedly showed Juan this tape and Juan said that Fernando should not watch it because it's going to be of his daughter. And Juan claimed that this tape showed the girls on stretchers being cut open by scalpels, but not by medical examiners, by people of power that he recognized. However, even though this could clear Miguel and Antonio of their wrongful conviction and place the rightful murders in prison, Juan will not let anybody see it. He now has it and he refuses to let anybody see it. Now, the priest was spoken to and he said that this is false, this never occurred. Fernando said that he's never seen the tape. Juan will not let him see it no matter what and that he really has nothing to do with Juan anymore. But Juan Ignacio Blanco has since been labeled as a liar, a manipulator. Basically someone who latched on to a grieving father and took the entire community through a storm that did not need to occur. But at this time, like we've discussed, the media was already allowing so much to occur, to derail the investigation, to skew the public's knowledge and view on it, that when Juan was having these outlandish claims, they allowed it to occur. And they kept inviting him back. You know, many people blame Fernando for letting it get out of hand. And he was the one who, you know, wanted the media attention from the beginning. But I do believe that it turned into from him wanting to help find the, his daughter and then find the real killers to being taken advantage of by Juan and not knowing really how to stop it or control it. But the news hosts, as well as all of the media back then, have now apologized for what had occurred and what they showed. And they say that everything was rushed back then, not thought through. They were just trying to get things out, not caring how it came across. They had no expertise in this. They really did not know what they were doing and they took it too far. But there is an update just this year in July of 2022, new DNA tests were finally requested for the clothes of Tony, Desiree, and Miriam, as well as the carpet that they were found with. Now, they were hoping to get more information on the three DNA profiles that were found three decades ago because there was nothing really ever done with that. But I was unable to find any results that have come from this, so maybe they are still working on it. There's so much more that could be done in this case 
But do you believe that Miguel and Antonio were responsible? Should Miguel have been charged? Should he have been released after 21 years when he had a 170-year sentence? And do you believe that Antonio is still alive today? Please let me know your thoughts on this, and I truly hope that we will find the truth one day and that, you know, I think that Antonio would lead to a lot of truth, whether we find him hiding and can question him or whether we find him deceased or whether someone comes forward with information they've been hiding for all these years. There's just something fishy about this case, something that doesn't quite add up. But let me know what you think and don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.